Chapter 8. Dead London. After I had parted from the artillery man, I went down the hill and across the bridge to Fulham. At the corner of the lane that runs to Putney Bridge Station, I found a man lying. He was covered with the black dust, alive but helplessly drunk. I could get nothing from him but curses and furious lunges at my head. There was black dust along the roadway from the bridge onwards and it grew thicker in Fulham. The streets were horribly quiet. I got food, sour, hard and mouldy, in a baker's shop here. On the Fulham Road, I saw about a dozen dead bodies covered in the black powder. They had been dead many days, so I hurried quickly past them. One or two had been disturbed by dogs. Where there was no black powder, it was curiously like a Sunday in the city, with the closed shops, the houses locked up and the blinds drawn. A jeweller's window had been broken open in one place and a number of gold chains and a watch lay scattered on the pavement. I did not trouble to touch them. Further on was a tattered woman in a heap on a doorstep. The hand that hung over her knee was gashed and bled down her rusty brown dress. A smashed magnum of champagne formed a pool across the pavement. She seemed asleep, but she was dead. I first heard the howling in South Kensington. I turned northwards and went up on the Exhibition Road. All the large mansions on each side of the road were empty and still. My footsteps echoed against the sides of the houses. At the top, near the Iron Hyde Park gate, I came upon a strange sight, a bus overturned and the skeleton of a horse picked clean. I puzzled over this for a time and then went on to the bridge over the Serpentine. The howling, it seemed to me, was coming from the district around Regent's Park. It grew stronger and stronger. The desolating cry worked upon my mind. I was intensely weary, foot sore, and now again hungry and thirsty. It was already past noon. Why was I wandering alone in this city of the dead? I felt intolerably lonely. I came into Oxford Street by the Marble Arch. Here again were bodies covered in black powder. There was also an evil, ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars of some of the houses. I grew very thirsty after the heat of my long walk. I managed to break into a public house and get food and drink. I was weary after eating and went into the parlour behind the bar. I slept on a black horse hair sofa I found there. I woke to find that dismal howling still in my ears. It was now dusk. I wandered on through the silent residential squares and came out at the top of Baker Street. In front of me, I could see Regent's Park, where far away, over the trees, was the hood of the Martian giant from which this howling proceeded. I was not terrified. I watched him for some time, but he did not move. He appeared to be standing and yelling for no reason that I could discover. I turned back away from the park and got a view of this stationary howling Martian from the direction of St John's Wood. A couple of hundred yards out of Baker Street, I heard a yelping chorus. I saw first a dog with a piece of red meat in his jaws coming headlong towards me then a pack of starving mongrels in pursuit of him. He made a wide curve to avoid me. As the yelping died away down the silent road, the howling reasserted itself. I came upon the wrecked handling machine halfway to St John's Wood Station. At first I thought a house had fallen across the road. It was only as I clambered among the ruins that I saw with a start this machine lying with its tentacles bent and smashed and twisted among the ruins it had made. 
I pushed on towards Primrose Hill. Far away, through a gap in the trees, I saw a second Martian, as motionless as the first, standing in the park towards the zoological gardens, and silent. As I crossed the bridge, the howling ceased. It was, as it were, cut off. The silence came like a thunderclap. London gazed at me spectrally. The windows in the white houses were like the eye sockets of skulls. A thousand noiseless enemies were moving. Terror seized me. I hid from the night and the silence until long after midnight in a cabman's shelter in Harrow Road. But before the dawn, my courage returned and while the stars were still in the sky, I turned once more towards Regent's Park. I soon saw down a long avenue in the half-light of the early dawn, the curve of Primrose Hill. On the summit, towering up to the fading stars, was a third Martian, erect and motionless like the others. An insane resolve possessed me. I would die and end it, and I would save myself even the trouble of killing myself. I marched on, recklessly. As I drew nearer and the light grew, I saw that a flock of black birds were circling and clustering about the hood. At that, my heart gave a bound and I began running along the road. I felt no fear, only a wild, trembling exultation as I ran up the hill towards the motionless monster. Out of the hood hung lank shreds of brown at which the hungry birds pecked and tore. I scrambled up the rampart and stood upon its crest. Below me was a huge pit and scattered everywhere were dead Martians. Some were in their overturned war machines. Some were in their now rigid handling machines. A dozen of them, stark and silent, were laid in a row. The Martians had been slain by the disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. They were slain as the red weed was being slain, after all man's devices had failed, by the humblest things that God in his wisdom had put upon this earth. I stood staring into the pit, and my heart lightened gloriously. The pit was in darkness. Dogs fought over the bodies that lay far below me. I turned and looked down the slope of the hill to where stood those two other Martians that I had seen overnight. They glittered now, harmless tripod towers of shining metal in the brightness of the rising sun. I looked out over London at this wide expanse of houses and factories and churches, silent and abandoned, I realised that this dear, vast, dead city of mine could once more be alive and powerful. I felt a wave of emotion and close to tears. Then with overwhelming force came the thought that my old life had ceased forever. <laughs>